Welcome to Hampton National Historic Site, a property of the National Park Service. We're in the Great Hall of Hampton Mansion, which is the centerpiece of this 63-acre park that became a part of the Park Service in 1948. Before that, it had been owned by seven generations of the same prominent Maryland family, the Ridgelands. Now, this had a great effect on the contents of the house in that many of them came to the Park Service at that time in 1948, and more were donated over the years. So we're very fortunate here at Hampton in that about 95% of what we show on exhibit in the period rooms is original to this site, to the house, and to the Ridgely family. Now when we go through and visit the different period rooms, we are going to be basically taking a tour through time because there was not a single famous person or a single famous event that is associated with this house, but more the lifestyle covering seven different generations from approximately 1790 to 1948. So then our period rooms are set to different periods of time, uh, beginning with the earliest in the 1790 to 1810 period, and right on up into the 20th century. So you, you get to see the evolution, as it, were, as it were, of styles and objects and technologies uh, throughout that time period. And it gives us a much wider range of topics uh, to interpret when you come here and visit Hampton, which we hope you'll do. Shall we move to the uh, parlor? Oh, the, yes, before we go. The Great Hall uh, is filled with family portraits and also other uh, paintings that were the Ridgley's acquired in the 19th century during their uh, trips abroad. But perhaps our most famous picture uh, is the one you see here. It is a copy of the original Thomas Sully painting of Eliza Ridgely, Lady with a Heart. In the mid-1940s, David Fedlin, who was the director of the recently formed National Gallery of Art, came to Hampton uh, seeking to acquire for the National Gallery's collection the great original Sully of Eliza Ridgely, Lady with a Heart. He was eventually able to do that acquisition, but he also was able to assist John Ridgely Jr., then the owner of Hampton, uh, in helping to preserve the house. Uh, John Ridgely was very concerned at that point that uh, a cro encroaching development in the area and the very high cost of maintaining this property uh, would lead the house to be sold and perhaps even torn down and the collections dispersed. So with the help of David Fenley and other historic preservationists, and particularly the National Park Service, uh, they were able to work out an arrangement whereby the Mellon Family Foundation called the Avalon Foundation was able to donate money through which the 63 acre property and the the mansion and some of its collections were acquired by the National Park Service. Uh, that happened in 1948 when the site was designated Hampton National Historic Site. The enabling legislation which was passed by Congress says it was preserved for its architectural importance and that is one of the things we interpret here in Hampton but we also interpret a much broader story of all the people who lived and labored here from the 18th century through the 20th. So this painting, uh, the original, is now in the National Gallery of Art, and this is a very good 1950 copy uh, that was done for the house. We're going to proceed now uh, to go through our period rooms. We're going to go roughly chronologically because I think it just makes a little more sense that way. Uh, as we go through and, and look in the period rooms, you will see uh, 
a variety of quite elaborate reproduction curtains and wallpapers and carpets. Uh, and I would just like to mention that those uh, elaborate interior settings you're going to be, be seeing uh, are very much uh, made possible through the generosity of private donors, private individuals, foundations, uh, interested groups such as the Colonial Dames uh, of America and, and our, our Women's Committee of Historic Hampton, and all these uh, agencies help to support this house and make these beautiful interiors. We are now in the parlor, uh, which is set to the earliest time period of residence here at the house, 1790 to 1810. The first thing I want to point out uh, is a painting of an individual, and that is over the fireplace. That is Captain Charles Ridgely. Uh, he was a ship's captain, but also a merchant, and later, very importantly, an iron master, uh, who with his uh, father and brother had founded an ironworks called Northampton Iron Works about a mile north of here. And it was that business, the iron business, that was really the basis for the family fortune. Uh, he, the painting uh, of both Captain Ridgely and his wife, Rebecca Dorsey Ridgely, which you see here on the other wall, uh, painted in the early 1760s, are by John Vesalius who was a native Marylander uh, who painted many, many examples of um, the landed gentry here in, here in Maryland in the colonial period. The, you will see in each of our period rooms uh, different settings. We actually change these settings twice a year. Uh, what the parlor is currently set up uh, to show and what would be an evening tea party, early evening tea party, uh, in the period around 1800. Uh, some of the things uh, that we would particularly point out for uh, the service of tea is this is a um, blue and gilt dessert service uh, by the Worcester factory dating from the late 18th century. The furniture in the room is principally, in fact, I think pretty much exclusively, uh, with, well, one, one uh, other notable example of Maryland make. Uh, particularly, uh, there are a couple important pieces to point out. The armchair here, which is one of a pair, was made by one of the most famous names in Maryland cabinet making and that is John Shaw of Annapolis. These, this pair of chairs were actually not originally made for Hampton, though they came here quite early on. They are two from a large suite of chairs that were made by Shaw for the Maryland State House in 1797. They got to Hampton uh, through the agency of the house's second owner, uh, who was a governor of Maryland, Governor Charles Carnan Ridgely, and when the furnishings uh, for the Maryland Senate chamber were dispersed uh, in the late 1820s, these chairs uh, were among them and Governor Ridgely was able to acquire them. There are some other notable pieces of Maryland uh, and Baltimore furniture here in the parlor as well, right here. Against the north wall, you see a beautiful federal sofa of the type that's called a cabriole sofa. Uh, as with many Maryland pieces, uh, and particularly Baltimore pieces, it is very closely derived from English design sources. In this case, uh, a, it is copying a plate in Heffel White's Guide, but you can also see the distinctive Baltimore bellflower inlay on the legs. Another very distinctive uh, Baltimore uh, design are the set of side chairs 
federal side chairs with an unusual shape of back that's called a modified shield back. It has serpentine uh, styles rather than simply curved ones and a serpentine lower rail rather than a bowed lower rail. And three distinctive splats with tear teardrop shaped piercings. Again, this is a, a form you really see only here in Maryland. And just like the Cabriol sofa, it is very closely derived from uh, English design sources. The final piece I'd like to point out in here is, um, I have to say, is one of the pieces that is not original to the Ridgely family, but is an example of something uh, that we know that they owned, but the original does not survive, uh, and that is a piano. Uh, pianos were very, very expensive uh, in the late 18th century, and it was quite a status symbol uh, in this country if you owned one. Uh, the one you see here is London made by George Astor and Company. Uh, we do know that the Ridgley's uh, family, particularly the second uh, owner of Hampton, Governor Charles Carnan Ridgley, purchased two pianos uh, through a supplier in Philadelphia who was selling, uh, named Carr, who was selling uh, imported English pianos. Uh, he purchased a uh, grand piano for his townhouse and a square piano, very similar to this, for his uh, Hampton, which was his country house. We're going now to the dining room, uh, which is set to the next time period. I didn't mention it first when we were in the Great Hall, though I'm, I'm sure you could see how large it is. Um, Hampton was perhaps the largest private residence in the United, new United States when it was completed in 1790. Uh, Captain Ridgely had begun having it built uh, immediately at the after the close of the Revolutionary War in 1783, uh, and it took several years to complete, and it may, we believe, uh, could have been the largest private residence at approximately 24,000 square feet. I'm sure you can notice quite a change in style uh, when we walk here into the dining room. This room is set to the time period of the second owner of Hampton, uh, who was a governor of Maryland, Charles Carnan Ridgely, uh, approximately 1810 uh, into the late 1820s. Governor Ridgely died in 1829. Uh, this uh, room is filled with material that was uh, owned by uh, Governor Ridgely and ordered by him. I think you are probably noticing right away the rather dramatic uh, setting uh, of this room with the paint colors, wallpaper, uh, the blue and yellow curtains. Uh, all of this is based on documentation. Each of these period rooms we'll be seeing uh, have had uh, very extensive furnishings plans done for them, and they are based on an amazing amount of original documentation. Uh, there are literally millions of pieces of paper, documents, related to the Ridgely family and this house, uh, and we use those important uh, sources uh, to help us to help us uh, determine what to put in these different, different rooms uh, from different time periods. So as I always tell people, these rooms are not my pers necessarily my personal taste, though I would be perfectly happy with this dining room, uh, to have this dining room. Uh, but they do represent as accurately as we can make them 
uh, what was going on in those um, particular uh, time period of interiors. Uh, the blue, uh, the Prussian blue uh, paint on the woodworks accented with ochre yellow, again, has been documented uh, as being here in this time period through um, analysis of the painted surfaces. We know that there was wallpaper in this room, though we are uncertain of the exact pattern, but the one we uh, have chosen for this room is Monuments of Paris um, by Dufour, uh, which we know was being sold in Baltimore uh, in the uh, years when we also know that Governor Ridgely was having this room refurbished and was actually acquiring new furniture for it at the same time. The furnishings, you see the furniture uh, in the room, again, is all of Baltimore make and is of truly very high style Baltimore furniture. Most of it made right around 1815 to 1820. Uh, there is a magnificent large set of side chairs of a pattern uh, shape of splat and an overall design that is very typical of Baltimore chairs of this period. Uh, but uh, Governor Ridgely bought the deluxe model, uh, not just the standard model, in that it has very beautiful acanthus carving on uh, the crest rail and splats. Another important piece in the room is the fall front secretary or secretary, uh, Abatan. Uh, it was made, uh, we attribute it uh, to the workshop of William Camp, who was the uh, leading Baltimore cabinet maker, ran the largest shop uh, in Baltimore uh, in the, at this time period, in the 18-teens. A piece of furniture that I have to tell you is, uh, seems to be every visitor's favorite, and a lot of the staff as well, is the wonderful uh, small cellaret that you see down uh, near the end of the dining table. Uh, it is a very unusual form uh, in that it is shaped like a uh, little ancient classical temple um, with ionic columns on the corners. Other notable things uh, in, in this room include both uh, the porcelains and the silver. Uh, there are uh, a number of Baltimore's leading silversmiths of the early 19th century represented here, including William Ball uh, and uh, Andrew Elk Warner, uh, the, both the tall candlesticks and these beautiful wine coasters with the uh, grape, grapevine pattern uh, are by A.E. Warner. Also on the dining table, which is set for the first course of a, uh, a three-course meal, uh, is a magnificent set of porcelain, uh, a dinner service, a very large dinner service, uh, that was made for Governor Ridgely in Paris by the firm of Fuyer, and the plates are actually signed on the back. But as you can see, uh, they have custom decoration. Uh, in the center, you can see the coat of arms of the Ridgely family, uh, and particularly note the stag's head crest. Uh, that uh, is present on a great many of the decorative arts here at Hampton. It's, uh, we have it on uh, silver, of course, porcelains. Uh, it's uh, in stained glass. There are uh, curtain tiebacks. There are looking glasses. It, the list goes on and on uh, where that parts of the coat of arms, or particularly the stag's head crest, was used. Focusing on the elaborately um, set sideboard, we have uh, both English and American silver but the two most notable pieces are the two very large racing trophies uh, on the back of the sideboard. These trophies are called the Postboy Cups uh, after the 
champion thoroughbred that Governor Ridgely owned, uh, whose name was Postboy. Uh, a British visitor who came, uh, named Charles Parkinson, who came to Hampton at the very beginning of the 19th century, uh, noted that uh, in a publication of his travels that Governor Ridgely was, quote, very famous for racehorses. Uh, Parkinson had also said that Governor Ridgely, quote, kept the best table in America, uh, which means you could get very uh, fine and elaborate dinners here uh, if you were so lucky to be invited to Hampton. Uh, the Postboy Cups are uh, two trophies that the horse won for winning two consecutive uh, Washington, uh, D.C. Jockey Club races, which was uh, a premier uh, horse race in America. Uh, in the early 19th century. Postboy won those races in 1804, and the cup on the left is from 1804, and the cup on the right here is from 1805. Uh, and there's actually an engraved portrait of Postboy uh, on the side. What's interesting about the trophies is also, you can see if you took off the cap and finial here at the top, then the lid lifts off and forms a small punch bowl. They were made by Samuel Williamson of Philadelphia. Before we um, move on from the room, I do want to point out over the mantelpiece, um, the single painting that is in this room is a very important one. Uh, that is a portrait of John Eager Howard. Uh, he is portrayed by Charles Wilson Peel uh, in his colonel's uniform uh, from the Revolutionary War. He was a hero of the Revolutionary War. He was later a governor of Maryland. Uh, two of Governor Howard's sons married two of Governor Ridgely's daughters, which is how the portrait has come here to us. There's a very similar portrait um, of Howard uh, done at the same time, done in 1784, that is owned in the collection of Independence Hall in, in Philadelphia. One more example of the stag's head crest we can see here on the side table with desserts uh, beautiful porcelain uh, dessert service, in this case made by Coalport, and they are marked on the back. We're going to uh, proceed across uh, the hall to back through the Great Hall to the drawing room. I do want to point out, uh, you can see our doors are faux painted to imitate mahogany and very boldly faux, faux painted. This of course is reproduction, but when we get to the drawing room, I will show you uh, where we have cleaned down the paint on a panel and you can see the original graining that we were copying to do the reproduction. <clears throat> Welcome to the drawing room, uh, which uh, we have furnished to the period before the Civil War, uh, 70, pardon me, 1840 to 1860. The drawing room, as you can see, is really filled uh, with furniture. And again, that we have done the research that shows, and there is documentation to show that in this pre-Civil War time period, there was indeed uh, two large parlor suites in this room at the same time. 
I should point out, I had mentioned earlier that oh, uh, approximately 95% of what we have on exhibit is original to the house or to the Ridgely family. I have to say in the drawing room, we're actually at 100%. Everything that you see in here down to uh, even uh, the uh, souvenirs of travels to, to Europe that are on the, on the two uh, console tables under the mirrors are original uh, to the family and to this house. Now, <clears throat> the furnishings in here, uh, the setting I will just briefly mention. Again, as everything is original, uh, the red silk damask upholstery fabric uh, actually survived on three of the uh, pieces of seating furniture until about 20 years ago. Uh, the original tassels for the curtains, original exam these are reproductions, but originals survive. Uh, two of the um, four original uh, window shades survive uh, that we were able to copy to make these reproductions. Um, the wallpaper is copied from late 19th century photographs of the room. Uh, it is a, cop a French paper uh, from the 1840s. So again, uh, the, all the uh, soft furnishings. The carpet is particularly uh, interesting. It is a reproduction, but a very large piece of this car original carpet that was in this room, about a 20 by 20 foot fragment, survives uh, in our collection. Uh, the original carpet was ordered for the room in um, November of 1850 and is of a type called a tapestry velvet. Um, and the technology for that, uh, to do uh, the very distinctive technology that created carpets that in this case has, I think, 43 different shades of yarn, um, unfortunately no longer exists. So we had to use an adapted wet Axminster uh, type. But it does faithfully reproduce the appearance of the carpet. Now I mentioned that there are two parlor suites in here uh, of only dating perhaps 12 or 13 years apart uh, in date. The most famous one and probably the most important furniture in Hampton is a large parlor suite uh, that was made uh, by one of Baltimore's most famous craftsmen, and that is Hugh Fen uh, pardon me, John Fenley. Uh, John and his brother Hugh had a very um, successful and prestigious company making painted furniture in the early 19th century. Our suite includes uh, this extraordinary um, square back sofa with gilded swan arms based on a design uh, plate by George Smith in his 1808 publication. There are 14 chairs, a center table, and a pier table. Uh, the original bill for this furniture survives in the family, um, and so that we know it was made for this room in 1832 by John Fenley. Uh, earlier, um, John and his brother Hugh are renowned for having made furniture uh, for James and Dolly Madison's White House in uh, 1809. Now, just a year after Eliza Ridgely had ordered this magnificent suite of drawing room furniture, uh, she and her husband went abroad for about 18 months. Uh, and when they got there, they I think Eliza must have discovered to her uh, dismay that the neoclassical taste, uh, such as her suite of painted furniture uh, is in, uh, was really on the way out by then, and there was a new popular taste, which was for uh, the Rococo. Uh, it was called at the time the modern French, or often it was called Louis XIV, only uh, actually it's Louis XV, uh, but 
not long after Eliza returned from this uh, lengthy trip abroad uh, in the early 1840s, she acquired uh, a whole new parlor suite that was in the newly fashionable Rococo takes. And that includes, um, there are a pair of couches, uh, a tete-a-tete, four upholstered back armchairs, uh, side chairs, and two upholstered uh, armchairs. The designs of uh, some of these uh, pieces, the designs are based on those that were published by Thomas King, uh, an English designer uh, in the mid 1830s. And again, from documentation, we know they were here in this room at the same time. Other notable uh, features in here are, are the magnificent pair of uh, large pier glasses uh, that have the shield from the Ridgely family coat of arms at the top, and then there are four matching window cornices as well. <clears throat> Uh, the mirror, at, at, we can actually date them uh, because they have uh, 1843 newspaper uh, lining the backboards, and uh, which would make them probably the earliest documentable examples of Rococo revival in the United States. Another uh, very unusual survival uh, in an American family is here on the center table, this magnificent ewer, which was made in Paris by a French silversmith named J.A. Cresson between 1819 and 1823. The history of how it came to here to Hampton uh, is really quite remarkable. Uh, it is said by the family to have been a present from the Marquis de Lafayette when he was here uh, visiting the United States and particularly visiting Baltimore. Uh, many families here in Maryland have stories about gifts from Lafayette, but we think this one is probably pretty likely because when Lafayette was uh, in Baltimore in 1824, he was entertained at two private houses uh, for uh, ceremonial dinners. And one of those two houses was the house of Eliza Ridgely's father. In fact, Eliza at that time met the Marquis, played her harp for him, and started up a personal correspondence with him that lasted till his death in 1834. Uh, I mentioned that trip that John and Eliza originally took abroad in 1833-34. Uh, they actually visited uh, Lafayette at his uh, private country home, LaGrange, uh, when they saw him just a, a very few months before his death later that year. So uh, we do believe that uh, this magnificent um, French ewer uh, was a gift to actually probably to Eliza's father originally uh, by the Marquis de Lafayette. There are two other uh, tables in the room also from the workshop of John and Hugh Finley, uh, a painted table that you see here along the north wall there's a pair here and the other one in the corner. Uh, very, very typical of Finley's, uh, the Finley brothers' work uh, in this time period and associated with an account uh, of Governor Ridgely paying for uh, furniture from the Finleys in 1822. The distinctive, distinctive cross-shaped, uh, X-shaped uh, base and that barrel uh, and ring turning of the shaft with the uh, brass rosettes is uh, very typical of the Finley's work, as is all the painted decoration as well. A 
Oh, yes, we did want to point out the, um, we have one door panel here cleaned down to show the graining, the original graining that dates uh, from right around the turn of the 19th century, right around 1800. The dark green color was one that was um, painted on this door around um, 1840 or 50, when that very bold, vivid graining had um, become out of style. <clears throat> We're going to proceed down to uh, a room that actually dates from after the Civil War. Uh, again, I mentioned that we uh, interpret uh, a broad range of time here at Hampton from the late 18th century right on up into the 20th. Before we go, I will point out, I mentioned the stag's head crest being everywhere, and the shot of the South wall of the uh, Great Hall will show that very clearly. Uh, you see uh, reproductions of original cornices with the stag's head crest, uh, the curtain tiebacks, uh, the stained glass over the door, which has the full coat of arms and the crest on top, and then there's a carved wooden uh, ex coat of arms over the door. Uh, mentioning the, um, the stained glass, uh, in the 1850s, Eliza Ridgely uh, had stained, very, quite elaborate stained glass windows uh, purchased uh, for the Great Hall. So if you can imagine it, uh, where you see the bright sunlight coming in, uh, in the mid 19th to all really to the mid 20th century, uh, there were stained glass, full stained glass windows in here. Uh, one 19th century visitor said it, give it gave it a very chapel-like appearance. Um, when the Park Service restored the house in 1948 to 1950, um, of course the whole fashion then in historic houses was to return them to their earliest original pe period and that was very much done with Hampton. They were very much focused on the late 18th through very early 19th century. So the stained glass windows were removed. Now I have to tell you, we are very pleased that they were saved and they are in our museum collection. So uh, we do still have the stained glass windows. We are in the music room now, uh, which as I mentioned is installed to the uh, post-Civil War period. We set the, uh, this room at roughly 1870 to 1890. You will see if you look around that there are paintings skied up the wall. Uh, and again, uh, this is not just a sort of fancy on our part uh, to get to get pictures out of storage and onto the walls. Uh, I like to um, affectionately refer to this room as the curatorial no-brainer because, uh, again, it's set to 1870 to 1890, and we have probably at least a half dozen images, photographs, of this room from the 1890s. Uh, <clears throat> so it really was um, pretty straightforward. Uh, when the furnishing plan for this room was being done, to look at those photographs and see what was hanging on the walls uh, and simply hang it there again. And because of the depth and originality of Hampton's collections, that was really easy to do. Uh, the paintings were still here, still in the collection, and we could simply um, put them back where they were. Uh, they include both uh, family portraits, uh, the Governor Charles Kern Ridgely's wife, you see in the oval, uh, up over uh, one of a pair of large 
Girondole mirrors uh, and other members of the family down here uh, below the mirror. That, that of course, is, is Queen Victoria, but um, other family members here. And then also there are um, beautiful uh, paintings, both ones acquired in Europe, like uh, the Dutch seascapes that you see here uh, in the corner, uh, but there are also some uh, by American artists as well. While we're mentioning paintings, over the mantelpiece is a portrait, a copy of the original portrait by Thomas Sully of Governor Charles Carnan Ridgely, uh, the second owner of Hampton. Uh, when in uh, 1945, uh, the National Gallery of Art acquired the great Sully of Eliza Ridgely, Lady with a Heart, uh, that was, uh, they, the gallery actually purchased that painting from the Ridgely family. However, at the same time, the family very generously donated the Thomas Sully uh, of Governor Ridgely uh, to the National Gallery, and it is uh, still in their collection. <clears throat> I'll briefly mention the, the setting in here, this very vivid yellow silk damask. Uh, it's actually the same pattern as the red silk damask that you saw in the drawing room. Uh, we know it was in here, uh, both by um, analysis of upholstery fragments, but also from the fact that the three uh, fabric window valances for this room uh, still survive. Uh, they are in the collection of the Maryland Center for History and Culture, formerly the Maryland Historical Society. So again, we were simply able to uh, have the fabric reproduced uh, and, uh, and the trimmings as well, and to know, uh, to be able to do what was in here at that time period. As you're looking at the windows uh, and at the south wall, you'll also see the very large, very, very large uh, pier glass uh, with the Ridgely family stag's head crest and the matching uh, window cornices. Uh, those pieces are perhaps the best documented furniture uh, in the entire collection here at Hampton. Uh, the original sketch for doing uh, the large pier glass uh, by the manufacturer, a, a very um, a man named Samson Karras who ran the largest and most um, successful of the uh, Baltimore looking glass makers in the mid-19th century. Uh, Samson Karras's sketch survives, uh, as does his original bill uh, that he sent to the Ridgeleys for payment. Then the account uh, in John Ridgeley's account book for paying for the looking glass and cornices survives. And then finally, the back of the um, looking glass itself, the backboards are signed in pencil by the installer uh, who installed that, uh, the mirror in um, June of 1851. So it really is a quite remarkable bit of surviving documentation. We had um, the house, uh, the mansion was closed to the public for three years between 2005 and 2007 when we did major systems installation of climate control and fire suppression. And at that time, we had to both remove that looking glass and then reinstall it three years later and um, with a very large team of people and professional assistants. Um, that is not a curatorial moment I hope to ever have to relive. Um, needless to say, it was nerve wracking. Now we are in the music room, uh, so named from the fact that uh, we have both the piano in here, the Steinway piano from the uh, late 1860s, but normally uh, a feature of the room, in fact the premier feature of the room, is right here by this uh, beautiful Baltimore uh, painted harp stand. And that is Eliza Ridgely's own harp 
survives and is in our collection, uh, made by uh, Erard of London in 1817. Uh, but in honor of its 200th birthday in 2017, uh, through the generosity of several private donors and uh, the efforts of both our uh, partner group, Historic Hampton Incorporated, and the Historic Hampton Women's Committee, uh, funds were raised so that the harp could be conserved in honor of its uh, 200th birthday. So it is actually, um, as we speak in New York uh, with the conservators, and specialist heart conservators, and uh, we hope will be returning to us this spring. As you look around the room, you can see uh, that in this post-Civil War era, uh, the furniture is more an accumulation of some newer pieces and some older pieces. The older ones, uh, sets of uh, armchairs that date uh, probably to the 1830s, a uh, beautiful Grecian couch, uh, which dates uh, right around 1830, and is quite an unusual early use of rosewood. Uh, but then a couple of very distinctive pieces of Rococo, Baltimore Rococo revival, uh, particularly the very large sofa that you see here in front of the fireplace. Now, when you do an installation, uh, sometimes you have to accommodate um, factors that the Ridgelys did not. Uh, the so that very large three-part sofa originally was right here where our visitor walkway is. And obviously, we couldn't even get people through the room if the sofa were placed in where it was uh, when we saw it in the photograph, so it has moved slightly. It's a very unusual form. In fact, um, I hesitate to use the word unique, but I've certainly never seen another <coughs> Rococo Revival three-part sofa of this design. Again, this was locally made here in Baltimore. Uh, the form of the sofa uh, is called a confidant uh, with its uh, separate chair-like ends. We do have uh, a wonderful, um, beautifully carved piece of Baltimore furniture here by a known maker because the original account for its acquis acquisition survives. Uh, this lovely ladies chair with a very, very intricate carving on its crest uh, was made by Robert Renwick. Uh, Renwick ran the largest and most prestigious firm in Baltimore in uh, the 1850s uh, and 60s, and this chair was made for Eliza Ridgely in 1857. On the north wall, you see a large uh, bookcase, a uh, library bookcase, made here in Baltimore uh, right around 1820. And you see it is filled with books. Those are just a few of the, oh, I think we have around 6,000 books uh, original to the, uh, to the house here uh, in our collection. Uh, I mentioned there are uh, both family portraits and um, European paintings uh, here in the music room. This is my favorite, really, of the family portraits. Um, this is uh, a portrait of four grandchildren of the family uh, playing in a stream that's down to the south of the house. You can actually see the mansion in the background. Uh, the four grandchildren, who you might think at first glance um, are both boys and girls, are actually four little boys. Uh, they're two pairs of brothers. On the left are 
Henry White and his brother Julian, uh, who were grandchildren of John and Eliza Ridgely's. Uh, then on the right here are uh, the children of John and Eliza's son, Charles. Uh, John, the eldest, born in 1851, and his uh, younger brother, uh, Charles. And Charles, as you can see, is seated on a Chesapeake Bay Retriever, uh, which was a favorite family hunting dog. The painting is by a man named Carlin, uh, and again, the original uh, bill for this survives as well. But then it was the fashion to dress little boys in uh, garments uh, that were very dress-like, frocks, uh, up until they were about five or six years old. You can see little Henry's actually in trousers because he's the eldest. He was, I think, seven when this uh, painting was done. So I think now we'll head back into the Great Hall to talk about the ethnographic study. Great. I'd love to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. I can't think of anyone better to share this incredible Thank site. You that was an amazing tour, uh, and I'm sure all of our furniture nerds who are joining us today will truly delight uh, in seeing all of that material. I know <laughs> some of your furniture nerds, so. <laughs> um, but I wanted to also highlight some of the other uh, incredible work that you've done here at Hampton, and that includes your ethnographic study. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the inspiration for that project. I'd be delighted to. Um, beginning in 2017, uh, we started here at Hampton a Park Service funded, uh, it's called an Ethnographic Overview and Assessment, and we just refer to it as the Ethnographic Study um, for uh, revenue's sake, um, to further investigate uh, the lives of the people that um, were enslaved here at Hampton, and then uh, a number of whom continued to work here after um, being freed. Uh, I mentioned uh, in my introduction uh, to my talk here today that uh, though Hampton was designated a National Historic Site for its architectural importance, that we really tell a much broader story uh, to the visitors, and that's very true. We don't discuss uh, only the Ridgely family that lived here for seven generations. Uh, when you visit, you will hear a much uh, broader story of all the people that lived and labored here, because after all, all the lavish uh, interiors that you see, the furniture and decorative arts, that was all made possible uh, by the labor of um, enslaved individuals. I had mentioned the uh, ironworks, uh, the Northampton Ironworks about a mile north of here, uh, had in the 18th and early 19th century been the real basis of the family wealth. Well, that was extraordinarily arduous, difficult labor, uh, dangerous labor. And again, uh, it was uh, the labor uh, principally well, in the 18th century, both of indentured and convict servants uh, from Europe, but also uh, uh, in, by the 19th century, exclusively, it was of uh, enslaved laborers. Um, at the height of the plantation uh, during Governor Ridgely's time period, there were, well, the entire estate, the greater estate, um, composed of the Hampton Home Farm, where we are now, and several other large properties, uh, 
At the time of his death in 1829, Governor Ridgely uh, owned uh, nearly 350 individuals. Now, good work, good investigative work into the, I mentioned those millions of documents associated with Hampton, which are held uh, both here at Hampton, uh, the Maryland Center for History and Culture, Maryland State Archives, and some other locations. But there are a lot of records related to the enslaved individuals that were here, uh, and then to workers later on in the, you know, in the post-Civil War era. Uh, a lot of good initial work had been done back in the 1990s, early 2000s, led by um, Dr. Kent Lancaster, who had been a professor at Goucher College, which is immediately adjacent to us. Um, so building on his work, uh, this ethnographic study, uh, which was undertaken beginning in 2017. We had an interdisciplinary team that was headed by principal, investi pardon me, principal investigator, Dr. Cheryl LaRoche uh, from the University of Maryland. Uh, I had the um, enormous pleasure of being the staff liaison and actually a researcher on the project as well. And um, through this, we have been able to enormously expand our knowledge of the individuals who, li who labored here. Uh, it had been our hope at the beginning of the project to take this vast wealth of documentary information and try and really learn more about the lives of individuals, not just the work they were doing, but who were their families, where they came from, what they did after they were freed, where they went, what were their lives and freedom like, and hopefully to find descendants uh, living in the current day. Uh, Dr. LaRoche and I were discussing at the very beginning of the project, I think we thought if we had been, if we found a half a dozen individuals, we would be thrilled, living individuals who were descendants. Um, at last count, I can't give you an accurate figure because there's so many hundreds of living descendants of the Hampton enslaved that and more, uh, we turn up more on a very regular basis. So, but it's many hundreds of people. And we have been able to interview many of those people. Uh, we have established family trees, some of them dating from the 18th century to the 21st through seven, eight, nine generations uh, of probably four, I think eight or nine different families. Uh, so it has been an extraordinarily worthwhile project. And what we've been able to do with this information is incorporate it into our tours, both here in the mansion, on the farm side, where we have, in addition to the overseer's house, several barns and outbuildings, we also have two surviving stand standing slave quarters that date from the 1850s, which is very unusual survival. So, but we don't, don't just talk about the enslaved over there uh, at the farm. We talk about them here and throughout the house. And now that we have stories of individuals to incorporate, it's not just statistics. It's really personal stories. Uh, we, the same sort of tour you and I just did uh, we could have do, do a comparable tour in this house of the individuals who we know who would have been assisting in all those rooms and working in those rooms. And it's not just saying a name, it's saying, well, for instance, in the dining room, uh, in the mid 19th century, the head waiter, uh, <clears throat> we could tell you uh, not only his name, which was Mark Posey. We can tell you the names of his two wives, all his children. The fact that in 1852, his 15-year-old daughter decided to uh, flee um, from slavery um, and sought her freedom and wound up living in Baltimore City, was never recaptured. Um, we can tell you what Mark did when he was finally freed by emancipation in 1864. Uh, and you know, what did he do? 
I, he continued to be a waiter. He just worked for a, a hotel in Towson. Uh, one of the important things we established, we used to regularly be asked by the public, well, where did people go? Because they were free. And we would sort of wave, wave a hand down south of here and say, well, we think a lot of them went to Towson, uh, which is the town uh, that Hampton is in, uh, the county seat of Baltimore County. There's a community, um, African-American community called East Towson, where the um, belief is that enslaved, formerly enslaved from Hampton established it. Um, but we couldn't really tell you for sure. We now know that yes, a number, particularly the, those free in 1864, did um, go to communities in Towson. One named Sandy Bottom, another, uh, yes, to East Towson. But we found that an almost equal number uh, went to um, Baltimore City. Before the Civil War, um, Governor originally in 1829, through his will, had magneted or freed a fairly substantial portion of his enslaved uh, workers. Uh, and particularly in that earlier period, um, an equal number of individuals moved into the city of Baltimore because there was economic opportunity there. There were already established African-American communities of free blacks. In fact, Baltimore had the largest population of uh, free blacks immediately before the Civil, Civil War in the United States. So there were, there were communities in support there, particularly uh, fraternal organizations and churches and that sort of thing. Uh, so that was something we hadn't really been so focused on. Um, so again, these are just a, you know, a tiny handful of examples. Um, and again, uh, to me, the most gratifying thing was being able uh, to work with Dr. LaRoche and other people on the team. And uh, they were principally doing the interviewing, but I had been able to also interview and talk to some of these living descendants. Um, my favorite story is one uh, descendant who lives just south of Towson now, um, was having his photograph taken for a major publication of the National Park, of the, on national parks um, related to the study. And I was able to work with a photographer and we were able to take, he's a great grandson of the, um, the head coachman here, uh, the man's, uh, in the 19th century, the, the coachman's name was Nathan Harris. And um, we were able to take a picture, have photographed his great grandson standing next to the Ridgely carriage uh, in the Ridgely stables that's right here and uh, can be seen when you visit, um, next to the carriage that his great-grandfather drove. And that was my, I have to say, that was my personal peak moment um, to be able to bring this story down to uh, the living individuals uh, in our community. Incredible, really amazing work. Like if people want to find more than enough for a book or a documentary, there was the study. The study has been published. Right. Uh, you can, if you go to uh, Hampton's website, um, <clears throat> you can uh, access it there. Uh, and um, and a lot of we have totally uh, we took we took advantage of the pandemic uh, when we couldn't be here uh, to uh, totally redo our website as far as uh, the content. And we have many of these stories of individuals are now on our website. Uh, so they're readily accessible to the public. And, uh, and also the published study uh, is uh, on, there's a link to it on the website. And we've also done uh, some new uh, tours uh, that you can take on your cell phone if you visit. Uh, that will uh, take you around to the grounds. Um, right now, the uh, park, the park, the exteriors are open seven days a week, 8.30 to 5 p.m. Uh, but the, the mansion and the buildings that are uh, available are open on Thursday through Sunday. And if you check our website, you'll see the schedule. Right now, with coming reopening uh, after the pandemic, uh, we're 
you know, it, it's been evolving, let's say. Mm -hmm. So always check the website uh, before you come because just this week we added another management tool. Uh, so um, yes, it's been uh, changing. Um, but uh, the mansion was closed entirely for nearly a year and a half. Uh, but it's uh, reopened at the end of September, so we're very glad to be able to welcome the public back. That is incredible, and we uh, want to thank you so much for being generous with your time, I'm for delighted. sharing your incredible work, as well as your knowledge. Uh, this has been a wonderful tour, and I'm sure everyone watching uh, will truly appreciate getting to see Hampton. Um, and if you do have a chance to come to Baltimore, it is more than worth it to come to see the site in public, <laughs> in person. Um, and to see the house as well as um, take in the, the surrounding land which is really impactful and important. Um, so thank you all so much um, and uh, I hope to see you again soon uh, for another virtual tour and again thank you so much for Thank you Carrie and we would welcome you all here. All right. Thanks so much.